letters and one question mark. Hope, it's a lovely day for a Guinness. Please enjoy responsibly. Drinkaware.co.uk for the facts. Be drink aware. Visit drinkaware.ie. UK and then took them back to Holland, which meant when he left the UK, he broke UK law. These mm. are episodes in his TV series. He recovered a gold ring that belonged to Oscar Wilde that was worth about $100,000. He recovered it in London, took it back to the Netherlands, and then had it sent back to the UK to be handed back to the Oxford Museum where it was stolen from. The fact he took it out of the UK means he broke the 2002 Proceeds of Crime Act, which, um, which if you've got something that's stolen, your legal obligation is to either take it to the local police station or to the person who lost it. Right. I mean, he could have gone to Scotland Yard, which was round the corner from where he recovered it in Hatton Garden. But no, he got he went straight back to the Netherlands with the ring and is posing with Oscar Wilde's ring in the Netherlands. Another case was where he had an Iranian book of poems worth half a million dollars stolen in Germany. He recovers it in the UK, takes it. Um, takes it to the Netherlands on an aeroplane and even comments he hopes that the gold leaf doesn't set off the alarms at the customs. He, he smuggles it back to the Netherlands, takes it to Germany and claims the publicly offered reward of 50,000 euros. So Arthur Brand recovers things, but by, he recovers things no one else can because he pays criminals. And also he uses his media connections as a shop window for stolen art. Not just this Lauren Van Gogh was the first time in history that an outstanding stolen artwork was published in the media. Subsequent to that, only a, a month ago or, or so ago, he published proof of life photographs and, and video of some Lucian Freud paintings, which were stolen in Germany worth $30 million. And on the tweets, he even gives an asking price. And what he's doing there, whilst he's saying on the tweet, let's stop this sale, he's not. He's actually saying to rich criminals out there, these are for sale and they're $4 million. And then when a deal goes down behind the scenes, Arthur Brown gets 10% off the seller, 10% off the buyer. So on a deal of €4 million, Euros, Arthur Brown would get €800,000. Now, how do you know the specific numbers? How do you know he's getting 10% on one and 10% on the other? Because that's the going rate. That's the going rate right when you do this. You know, I mean, I've been there, I've done this. I know, I know, I know. Well, and you're like, 30, yeah, albeit 30 years ago, but yeah. things don't change. And to be honest with you, the reason, what I would like to say was in the 19th century, when the US cavalry wanted to track down Native American Indians, Native Americans, who did they use? Native Americans to track them. So in other words, in this case, if you've got master criminals in the art crime world, right? Who do you want to track um, uh, to track them down? A former master art criminal who knows how they think, how they operate, and how they work. So that's the analogy that I would give about my role within the art crime arena. So, so am I right to understand that you've been watching this Arthur Brand on TV and it just irks you and you're saying, no. "Hey, man, this is my real life. This is what I've done my whole life, and this guy's—I don't like the way he's doing it." No, 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 not not at all. No, not 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 at all. I've seen him for about seven, eight years operating, and I can see the flaws in every single case that he 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 um recovers. I can see what he's done. He, he goes to criminals and says, "Have you got any stolen stuff? I can recover it, and I can get any reward that's on offer, and I'll give that to you as long as I can film it for my TV series." Or he says. Um, if there's no reward, give me proof of life. I'll get it published in the New York Times. Um, and then a rich criminal will come in and then we'll do a deal. You'll get the, your money. The criminal will buy it and I'll get my percentage. That's yeah, This is nothing personal. And the dispute I had with Arthur Brand um, and others, I always play the man, not the ball. Sorry, I always play the ball, not the man. They play the man. They have put, all they've got against me is making personal attacks on me, personal attacks on my family, um, uh, 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 my my son, his thirty-seven week pregnant partner, and um, that's all they can do, right? And and um, you know they can't silence me because um, and the truth 
you know, is out there for everyone to see now. I mean, um, you know, you know, you and I have spoken. I've sent you the links. I've taken you through it, and you can see that you know the, um, how plausible this this whole thing is. Okay, we're gonna play the uh, the voicemails when we come back. Let's take a little commercial break. We are with Turbo Paul. Fascinating content, Mr. Paul. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Uh, check him out at stolenvermeer.blogspot.com and arthostage.blogspot.com. These are his two blogs where he talks in depth about these major art heists. Five hundred million dollars. This is no joke. This is all serious stuff here. Uh, we'll be right back more with uh, Mr. Art Hostage Turbo Paul after these messages. And now a word from our sponsors. The Opperman Report is brought to you by Aquadam.net. You can give them a call at 707-764-2119. A flooded home is never easy to deal with. You're left with the mess to clean up, the insurance companies to deal with, and not to mention all the memories, the precious memories that are lost in the flood. You can never replace those. And Aquadam can be a tool in your arsenal to protect your home and property from the floodwaters. The coffer dam is filled with water to control water and is reusable as long as it's taken care of. It can protect your home or business from rising flood waters like a dam, but without the beavers. It can also be used in construction. If you need an area to be dewatered, an aqua dam can do the job. An aqua dam was used at SeaWorld in Orlando for the Mako roller coaster ride during the coaster's construction by dewatering the work area. An aqua dam is now dewatering the work area at San Antonio SeaWorld for their newest roller coaster ride. An aqua dam has been used in many construction projects all around the U.S. and all around the world. Now give aqua dam a call 707 764 2119. You can look them up online at aquadam.net. You can find them on Facebook at Aquadam Inc. And you call them up, you email them, you tell them Ed Opperman sent you, and they're going to take 10% off the price. Aquadam.net, 707-764-2119. If you find yourself in need of legal representation, it can be a very stressful time in your life. In my career, I have dealt with thousands of lawyers, I've dealt with thousands of law firms, and I confidently recommend to you Keith M. Davidson at kmdlaw.com. Available 24 hours, seven days a week, just log into kmdlaw.com, that's kmdlaw.com, or you can call toll-free 833-4-KMD-LAW, that's 833-4-KMD-LAW. Personal injury, wrongful death, STDs, sexual assault, car accidents, they handle it all efficiently and professionally. It doesn't matter how imposing the opposition may be, because the team at kmdlaw.com are battle-tested and fierce. They will not stop until justice prevails. Go to kmdlaw.com or call toll-free 833-4KMD-LAW. If you're in for the fight of your life, stop screwing around and contact KMD Law. Before Epstein was the Franklin cover-up. Before that, the Finders. And long before that, the Cleveland Street Scandal. Pedogate Primer is a concise intro and overview of a growing child abuse epidemic worldwide. It features shocking instances of institutionalized and organizational pedophilia throughout history. Churches, cults, the world of arts and entertainment, the government, NGOs, charities, and major corporations are all complicit or culprits in many instances. Pedogate Primer delves into material that for many may seem like the stuff of conspiracy theories. For this reason, the book draws on academic resources, declassified documents, and other reliable sources, and steers clear of conjecture. Such shocking true stories need no embellishment. It's the Opperman Report, and now, here is Investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, we're here today with our friend, uh, Turbo Paul, also known as Art Hostage on Twitter. Uh, you can find him there, and his website, his blog is stolenvermeer.blogspot.com and arthostage at blogspot.com. Uh, talking about the... Um, uh, the, the big heist in Boston, there, another one in the Netherlands. So, Mr. Uh, Turbo Paul, would you like us now to play those voicemails from Mr. Uh, uh, Octave Durham? Sure, yeah. Um, play number five first. Okay, and what are we going to hear here when we play this? Right, right. Now, number five, right. This is all to do with Octave Durham confirming that Peter Roy Cock bought the Van Gogh when he was in jail. Now, he was arrested on July the 2nd, so it must have been after July the 2nd. Arthur Brand published proof of life of the Van Gogh in the New York Times on June the 18th. OK, so it doesn't take it's not rocket science to work out that the proof of life is 
he's produced. Peter R Roy Cock gets arrested on July the 2nd, and subsequently, right, he has seen the Van Gogh. He then buys it for 400,000 euros, right, which I personally believe Arthur Brand has committed a crime after the fact. Okay, here we are. A uh, voicemail from Octave Durham. He bought it while he was in jail, my man. I cannot tell you any everything. You will see what's going to happen. He made a mistake. He was already in jail, and then he bought it. Okay, and, and what are we going to hear in the next one? Um, I, I'm not sh too sure about the next one. Um, <laughs> uh, um, what he's actually said is there's so many voicemails. I couldn't hear that voicemail that you play, um, that you played, but I think at the end of it, he says something profane. He says some profanity directed towards Arthur Brand. No, he, he didn't. He just says he bought it in jail, my friend, is what he says. Yeah, that, that's the first one. Right, that, the first one. The 12 second one that he said. Yeah, he, and my friend, he bought it in jail. He made a mistake. Um, he bought it in jail. Now, then okay. the next the next voicemail, um, do you know, I can't remember exactly what it says, but I know it ends with Octav Durham um, saying profanity and saying a swear word against Arthur Brand, saying that he doesn't care about Arthur Brand. Gotcha. Okay, we'll have to clip that part out, but we're going to let's play it right now. It has to be that somebody wants to claim I, I solved it. It, it. it will be a DA or somebody else. That's the problem. He doesn't fix it. It's ridiculous. Because if you really want it back, I'll bring it back. But I, I have to have approval. I could go now by myself. I can go to that person and say, the painting has to come back. This and this is going on. He'll be like, what? And he will bring it. I'm sure. I don't... It's a coincidence that this guy who is in jail knows this person that I know. I just found out. Arthur told me uh, two days ago. I said, what? And Arthur wanted him to tell me next week, but he told me, so keep, keep it for yourself. And uh, even, even the DA, everybody knows that I know this person very well. And this person won't talk to anybody, but will talk with me. Okay, we, we got through that one without any obscenities, too. But he does talk about Arthur and about how his friend in jail will return the art uh, as, as soon as he asks for it. Uh, exactly. So. And, and Octave actually says himself, you know, I can go and get it in an hour. As soon as I get the okay, and, and, and Peter Roy Cox, man on the outside, right, is, will only speak to Octave Durham. And then Octave Durham made the introduction for Arthur Brand. Also, in that, um, um, I think that's voicemail eight, um, Octave Durham um, has delusions of grandeur, saying that when they recover the Van Gogh, they're going to fill an arena in Rotterdam with 20,000 people giving lectures, um, you know, 20,000 people listening to Octave Durham and Arthur Brand <laughs> giving lectures on art crime. Um, so, yes. I, it, it seems also, too, that uh, he, he says... If I tell the person this is going on, they'll return it right away. It seems like these are like honest people who are buying this art. Uh, the end user are like honest people with a lot to, to lose. So if, if they heard that the cops were on their tail, they would give it up right away. Well, yes. I mean, he said, yeah, he says that you have to sort of understand that whilst Octave, um, he's talking to me um, um, and quite openly, I mean, he's still being quite guarded. Um, in what he says, I mean, there's many other voicemails where he, you know, he's much more forthright. Um, but yes, um, you know, this has been, um, um, despite the fact that Peter Roycock is facing major drug and weapons charges, at the end of the day, he's been used as a patsy by Arthur Brand. Mm. Arthur Brand has used this um, um, this international organised crime boss um, as a patsy um, uh, uh, in his big scheme to steal and return the Van Gogh. And the only reason he had to um, publish um, proof of life and sell it for 400,000 euros was to pay the thieves who, who took it originally. Okay, let's listen to the last one. Uh, voicemail 11. It's one minute, 17 seconds long. Okay. They're coming from everywhere. They want us to everywhere. I already got a college tour out here. It's not a college tour. I don't know how to say it in English. In Hall of Holland. And... From, from a Danish uh, production company, now the biggest in Holland wants us, and you can imagine what happens if you find that painting back. They say uh, you can, yeah, you don't know these places here, but you can, uh, we can fill an arena with 20,000 people. All these things are gonna go. That's what I'm doing. 
I'm not gonna be in the media, maybe in a written press, but I'm not gonna be on the television very soon. I don't, I don't like it. I made my thing, I have my platform, and it's okay now, and uh, it's all right with me. I don't like the spotlights, but for this, you have to come in the spotlights. And I did what I've done, and uh, I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be, and things are gonna happen, especially with MJ. And all, the, all these things are coming now. This burglary, what happened, is my advantage because they will talk about me again. People will, you know what I mean? I'm surprised that the press doesn't call me, but I think for me they said, hell, oh, we don't call him and he gets too much attention, you know? I don't give, I don't care anymore. It's, 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 it's okay like this, it's okay. Art, I don't give a shit about Art, I don't. Yeah, okay, that's the one with the obscenity. <laughs> and then he does talk about he's going to fill an arena with 20,000 adoring fans to hear his, uh, his commentary on stolen art and his life of stolen art. I tell you. Uh, yeah, I think he mentioned something about he's stolen everything except a nuclear weapon. Thank, <laughs> goodness, thank, thank goodness he hasn't stolen. I didn't catch that part. But uh, now, uh, someone was telling me, too, that uh, the, these people who arrange these major art thefts, you refer to them as Dr. No? No, well, that, 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 I mean, um, to be honest with you, it's not so much a Dr. No character. What you do is, is, is you get people who are very, very wealthy... Um, would um, buy some stolen art and then they would have it in a little room um, and they would show just a few friends and it would be something that they could get a kick out of. Also, high-value stolen art, art um, is bought by Mr. Biggs or Dr. Nose to put away in case they get in trouble and they can use it as a bargaining chip. Wow. Also, they buy high-value stolen art Right, um, and they use them in drug deals. Now, if you're a drug dealer, Ed, of course you're not. But if you were a drug dealer, okay, and um, uh, um, and I wanted 100 kilos of Class A narcotics, instead of, 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 of getting money at the transfers and having all the record of that, I would get, have a $20 million Picasso that's stolen in a bank vault. I would give you access to that bank vault with the key and with the number and everything. And then you would give me the drugs. I would go and sell the drugs. And then when I come back with the money, you would then give me the Picasso back. So it's a way, because of money laundering laws and electronic transactions and tracking people all over, it's a way the underworld uses as a currency. And it's a way that keeps the, um, the wheels of the underworld lubricated because big, uh, large amounts of cash. Also, if you get caught with a stolen painting, the, the consequences are minimal, um, tiny, compared with if you got caught with, say, narcotics or weapons. You get caught with $10 million worth of Class A narcotics, you're going to jail for a long time. You get caught with a $10 million stolen Picasso, you're going to get, what, two years in jail, three years in jail? So at the end of the day, it's risk-reward. Everything in life is risk-reward. And so they lower the risk um, by using stolen art as collateral on drug deals, arms deals, and other deals like that. And historically, there are cases where that has been proved. So this myth about a doctor no on an island um, is, is part true, but not completely true. There are people out there like that, because, and also famous people. Famous people have been found in possession of stolen art. Now, they, they say they didn't know it was stolen, and we have to believe them. I mean, Steven Spielberg was um, was in possession of Norman Rockwell's painting called Russian Schoolroom. Right? It was hanging on his office wall. At the same time, it was on the FBI's most wanted list of art stolen. Um, he handed it back, obviously, and there was a court case afterwards. Um, uh, Giov Giovanni Versace, the designer who, got, who was murdered in Miami, um, when he died, he's estate when it went to auction all his art collection three four five pieces um turned out to have been stolen all over europe um and other places that he bought over the years um boy george the pop singer he bought an icon had it on his wall and during a promotional video someone from cyprus noticed that it was an icon stolen from a church in northern cyprus in the 1974 turkey greece war so famous people have been caught um with stolen um stolen artworks and obviously they'll say they didn't know they were stolen but they're what's called end users when they buy them they never get sold unless when they die their estate gets sold and sometimes it doesn't get sold so it gets passed down and so 
that stolen art will be lost for generations. Fascinating stuff, my friend. We only got about ten minutes left. Actually, sure. about nine minutes left. Which story would you like to, to share with us uh, about the, uh, the the Boston uh, uh, paper? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, the Boston the the, the, the Gardner art heist happened in 1990. Thirteen pieces of a very valuable artwork, including Vermeer's The Concert, Rembrandt's Only Seascape, The Storm on the Sea of Galilee, um, and Manet, Degas drawings were taken. Estimated to be worth today $1 billion. $1 billion. Anthony Moray, security director of the Garden Museum, values the Vermeer at $500 million on its own. Rembrandt's Storm on the Sea of Galilee is worth $300 million. Rembrandt's Lady and Gentleman in Black is worth one hundred million, and the rest is worth one hundred million. So that's one billion dollars. Now, what has happened over the years? The museum has put out a reward for ten million dollars for all thirteen pieces recovered in good condition, and that's the catch. It, now, the likelihood of all thirteen pieces being together is very remote, but the terms of the reward is if you handed one back or two back. They can legally say, no, we're not paying any reward until we get all 13 back. Also, the, the condition of saying that the artworks have got to be in good condition. Well, we know se several of the paintings were cut from the frame, so they wouldn't be in good condition. So the term good condition is subjective and it's designed to deceive. OK, now, um, my idea... It, um, because the Gardner Museum and the FBI have been saying for, for nearly two decades that all they want is the Gardner art back. They're not interested in prosecuting, which is a complete lie. Because I will ask this question. Why are the FBI still investigating the Gardner art heist case? All the statute of limitations for the original theft expired five years after the theft in 1995. I tell you why the FBI are still investigating, because they are still intending to prosecute people under the 1994 Major Theft of Artwork Federal Act, which gives minimum 10 years in jail with no possibility of parole. And the proof of that pudding is that every person that has stepped forward in the last 30 years with possible information has been given a stark choice, become a participating informant and you've got to be willing to testify. And when the person says no and tries to walk away, the FBI pursue them, set them up, sting them. Robert Gentile, they've done twice, right? They set him up right, as agent provocateurs um, on some um, prescription drugs charges in 2012. And then again, when he got released from jail, they set him up again in 2016 on web, and they sent an, an undercover FBI informant in to sell him a gun. And again, they said all these charges can disappear if you cooperate on the Gardner case and are willing to testify. He refused to cooperate, and he served the other five years and was released um, last last March. He's a very elderly man, over 80. Reports have been done. So everyone who knows... Anything about the Gardner art case is terrified to come forward because they know it's a trap. And all I would like to say is that I have no problem with that. If the FBI would come out and tell the truth and say, yes, we're looking to prosecute under the 94 Major Theft of Artwork Act, and we only want an informant who's willing to testify, fine. OK, and the museum can come out and say, well, we'll give $10 million, but we want every single artwork back, not one, two or three. Um, but the trouble is, is that they speak out of both sides of their mouth. In public, they say, we only want the art back. There's $10 million reward and there's full immunity for anyone coming forward. But the reality is completely different. Now, my idea, which I've had, and I started a change.org petition, is to create what I call the Gardner Art Reward Price List which has all 13 pieces of stolen gardener artworks listed with a reward for each individual piece, right? And so if someone has got one drawing or that's got the bronze eagle or something else, an etching, and, and they hand it back, they can look at the reward price list and see how much is offered. 
right? The reward pro price list is benign enough not to harm the investigation, but it certainly will flush out perhaps lesser value stolen Gardner artworks. Maybe not the Vermeer and Rembrandts, but maybe the Degas drawings, maybe the Rembrandt etching, maybe the bronze um, vase that was stolen, maybe the bronze eagle that was stolen. At this point in time, it's 31 years since the Gardner art heist, and not a single Gardner artwork has been recovered. And the problem is, is Anthony Amore, the security director of the Gardner Museum. He runs the Gardner um, heist investigation like his own personal fiefdom. Okay, since he's been working at the Gardner Museum, he's got over two million dollars in salary. He's written five books. He had a run for Secretary of State for Massachusetts. Okay, and he spends every day, all and every day, go to his Twitter, Anthony Amore, and you're seeing on on social media every single day. You know, where does he get time to investigate the Gardner case? And he's in, and he's sixteen years at the Gardner Museum has produced not one single Gardner artwork recovered. Turbo Paul, I cannot thank you enough. This has been a, a rocket ship uh, right out of the gate here from start to finish. Uh, stolen Vermeer, blogspot.com, arthostage.blogspot.com. Don't forget, we, Mr. Uh, Turbo Paul gave us uh, three exclusive voicemails of Mr. Uh, Octavia Durham, uh, pretty much confessing to his involvement with these crimes. I, I would ask you, Mr. Paul, to keep us in the loop as new information comes forward. I'd love to put you back on the air and keep us posted on what's going on here. But I can't I, thank I, you enough. I, sh I certainly will. And if people would like to follow me on Twitter, I'm, I'm there as Art Hostage. And, you know, I give updates every, every single day. Plus, there's some other characters that um, I can reveal and always happy to come back and do another episode and shine another light in the dark corner of the art crime world. Uh, that's Art Hostage on uh, Twitter there. Uh, Mr. Uh, Turbo Paul, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Ed, and thank you for having me on. Good night. And now a word from our sponsors. Email.